The book of Daniel is divided into two sections, historical and prophetical. Chapters 1 through 6 are historical. Chapters 7 through 12 are prophetical. Now, because the book of Daniel is divided this way, it's not in chronological order. Now, for us in the Western Hemisphere, that really throws us off. Because whenever we read something, we want to read it in chronological order. So when we're reading things in the Bible, we just naturally assume that they're recording events that happened in chronological order. But the Jewish mind didn't work that way. They had the tendency to group things according to subject. In fact, that's the way it is in the New Testament. So when you're reading through the Gospels and you think, well, Jesus was here and the very next day he was here and then right after that. No, it's not that way. Many times they group things according to subject. So I I need you to understand that Daniel is divided in a way that's not chronological order. It's, It's divided in a way where it shows all the historical events and then it goes to the prophetical part. But that's not a problem. It's really easy to tell where each chapter fits chronologically. It's easy because the first verse in each chapter lets you know where it fits chronologically. The visions found in chapter 7 through 12 were all received after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So the whole prophetical section, chapter 7 through 12, it happened after Nebuchadnezzar died. Chronologically, though, chapter 7 and 8 take place, or took place, I should say, because it's past tense, before chapter 5. Now, for those of you who have never read the book of Daniel, or who haven't studied Daniel before, chapter 5 is all about the handwriting on the wall. Hopefully you grew up in Sunday school and maybe your Sunday school teacher told you about this story about Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the prince at the time. And the reason why I say prince is because his father was also reigning. But there was a period of three years in which they reigned together. And so you had his father who was the king and Belshazzar was the prince. Now, most people don't understand that, but when we get to the end of the story, it kind of makes sense because when Daniel comes in and he's able to explain what the handwriting on the wall is, he tells him that he's going to make him third in line in the kingdom. And you think, third in line? Well, who's number two? Well, Belshazzar was number two. But let me tell you a little bit about the story of the handwriting on the wall. The Medes and the Persians were attacking uh, Babylon. And Belshazzar's father... Uh, Nabonidus went out to fight them and he was defeated. So now Babylon was under siege by Cyrus. But Belshazzar didn't seem to be worked up at all. He didn't seem to be upset about it. And the reason he wasn't upset is because he had been told that he was safe inside the walls of the fortress. And as a result of that, he believed it. And to show everyone how unafraid he was and how confident he was that they weren't going to be able to get in, he actually threw this large party. And he invited a thousand nobles to come. Now, while he was drinking wine, this seems like the more wine that he drank, the happier he got and the more confident he became. So as he was drinking some of the wine, he decided that, you know, we're going to drink out of the golden and the silver goblets that had been taken out of the temple by his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar went in and and he actually laid siege against Jerusalem? And there was actually three periods of captivity took him out. But the last one, he actually destroyed the temple and took everything from the temple to Babylon. Now, he called for all of the silver and gold goblets to be brought to the party. And so they were all drinking out of this, in a sense, mocking God. And suddenly, this human hand appears, and it wrote on the plaster of the wall. you find that in verse number 5 of chapter 5. Now, of course, this scared Belshazzar and everyone else to death. So what did he do? He called for all the wise men to come and tell him what it said. What are these words that are written on the wall? This has to be by God. What does it mean? Now, all of these wise men came in, and it was just kind of like Nebuchadnezzar's dream. They couldn't interpret. They didn't know what it meant. And someone said, no, wait a minute. I remember that there was this man during your grandfather's reign who was able to not only interpret his dream, but to actually tell him what he dreamed. This man's still in the kingdom. Now, what most people don't understand is that Daniel, in a sense, had been retired for 23 years. He was a bigwig in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. But when Nebuchadnezzar died, he kind of drifted out of the scene. And all he was really doing was seeking God's face and studying the law. In fact, as he was reading through the book of Jeremiah, that's when he realized how long the captivity would take place and what all God was going to do. 
So someone remembered about Daniel and they said, let's call him. And so Daniel comes in. And sure enough, he's able to read the writing on the wall. It said this, three words. Meany, which means God has numbered the days of your reign and he has brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, which means therefore your kingdom is divided and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. And of course, verse number 30 tells us that very night, Belshazzar was slain because they diverted the river that ran underneath it and they were able to actually come inside the fortress and they conquered the Babylonians. So the vision we're going to study tonight was received before this happened. The Medes and the Persians are not in power. In fact, they don't see it coming yet because this is actually about three years before that time. All right? Now chapters 9 through 12... They're going to take place after chapter 5. In other words, they take place during the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire. Does that make sense? Well, let me tell you what I did. I put a timeline on the back of your handout to help you. So if you kind of want to know how the events happened in chronological order, how old Daniel was, all you have to do is look at that timeline and hopefully you can put it together. Is that going to help? Good, you can look at that later. We're going to move on. Tonight, we're going to study the vision of the four wild beasts found in chapter 7. But before we look at it, I need to explain a few things. The vision of the four wild beasts corresponds to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. We spent a lot of time on this dream. But the reason we've spent a lot of time on this dream is because so many of the visions that Daniel had corresponds to that dream. Does that make sense? Now, in the dream, and I'm going to review because you really need to understand this because everything hinges on it. In the dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw this huge statue of a man. The head of the statue was gold. The chest and arms were silver. The belly and, and not the thighs, the belly and the actually buttocks, but that's a little crass, I guess they would say. So we used the thighs in its place because we thought that was better. It's more of a euphemism. But the belly and the, the buttocks were bronze. The legs were iron. And the feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. And as Nebuchadnezzar was looking at the statue, this rock was cut from a mountain but not with human hands. And the rock came and it smashed the feet of clay and iron and it smashed it to bits. And the whole statue just kind of crumbled and the wind blew it all away. And then this rock grew into this great mountain until it covered the entire earth. That was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then Daniel went further and he interpreted the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He told him that the head of gold represented the Babylonian empire. But he said, your empire will not last forever. Eventually it's going to fall. And it's going to be replaced by the Medo-Persian empire. And it's going to reign a while, but even it eventually is going to fall. And the reason it's going to fall is because another empire is going to rise, the Grecian Empire. And the Grecian Empire is going to take its place. And, of course, that's represented by the bronze part of the statue. And then the Grecian Empire is going to fall, and the Roman Empire is going to take its place, which is represented by the legs of iron. And finally, even the Roman Empire, the fourth empire, and the last empire is going to fall. But in the last days, it's going to be revived. And it's going to be made up of a ten-nation confederacy. And during the reign of those ten kings, Christ is going to return. He's going to set up his kingdom upon the earth, and his kingdom is going to last forever. Now, that's the basics of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And you need to remember that. Because all of the other visions seem to go back to that. Does that make sense? Last week we looked at the ram of the uh, uh, we looked at the ram we looked at the vision of the ram and the he goat and remember that filled in the blanks to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Well, this vision is also going to correspond to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter two. Now, some of you might be wondering why Daniel would have another vision of basically the same thing. Well. There's actually three reasons for this. And if you're taking notes, hopefully you're going to write this down and add a little bit more than what we've given you. First of all, these visions are, and remember Daniel had a vision of the dream, so the dream and the vision are from two different perspectives. 
Nebuchadnezzar's dream is from man's perspective. You see, from man's perspective, a kingdom represents wealth, majesty, and power. But some kingdoms are wealthier than others. And some kingdoms are more powerful than others or stronger than others, which is also true of different metals. Some metals are more valuable than others and some metals are stronger than others. So the different metals in Nebuchadnezzar's dream represented different kingdoms. The Babylonian Empire was what? It was of gold. And the Medo-Persian uh, Medo Empire was represented by silver. And the Grecian Empire was represented by bronze. And the Roman Empire was represented by iron. And Nebuchadnezzar could relate to that. Especially since he represented the head of gold. Does that make sense? But Nebuchadnezzar could relate to that. In fact, if you go back to that time period, and especially if you go to Egypt and back to Babylon during that time, they were... Big into making these majestic palaces. And they would make these huge statues. In fact, in two weeks, we also went to Egypt. So I'm going to show you some of the statues that we saw. We went to the Cheops pyramids. We saw the Sphinx. We saw some of the other things. And those who went on to Luxor, they saw not only the palace, but they saw the, uh, the temples that the Egyptians had. And guess what's interesting? You would have all of these huge statues. So what, so what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was something that he was very used to. And it made a lot of sense to him. Does that make sense? On the other hand, the vision of the four wild beasts is from God's perspective. From God's perspective, these four kingdoms are like wild beasts devouring one another. He sees them as bestial in character. Maintaining their supremacy by brute force. Think about this. The lion devours its prey. In fact, sometimes the lion will actually kill something and play with it. How many of you have ever seen a cat catch a mouse, but the mouse is still alive and it just plays with it? You know what's kind of interesting? Cats will do that. Lions will do that. To teach their young how to hunt, they might semi-kill it and put it there, but they let the young come in and, and, and begin to prowl on it and do all of this. But they will devour its prey. The bear, it crushes its prey. The leopard springs upon its victims, and believe it or not, it sucks its blood. And the fourth beast can't even be described by a wild animal because there's nothing like it in nature. So this vision of the four wild beasts is from God's perspective. So one of the reasons that Daniel sees a vision that corresponds to Nebuchadnezzar's dream is because God wants Daniel to understand that the first vision he had of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is from man's perspective, the way man sees it. But now he's going to give him a vision of the very same thing, but he wants him to know this is from God's perspective. So that's the first reason he gives him a vision of the very same thing. Secondly, the vision of the four wild beasts goes much more in depth than Daniel's vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. When we get to verses 9 through 14, you're going to see what I mean. This vision is very similar to the vision that John had in the book of Revelation. In fact, one of the reasons that we stopped where we did in the book of Revelation, when we got to the second seal, is because you need to understand certain things before we continue on in the book of Revelation. Because much of what John sees in his vision is what Daniel saw in his visions. And if you don't understand what Daniel saw, it's kind of like, what's all this symbolism? But the great thing is, all of this symbolism is explained in the book of Daniel. So when we get to the book of Revelation, it's not explained. But we understand this vision is the very same vision that Daniel had. So we have to go back to the book of Daniel and we go, oh, this is what this means. Does that make sense? And last but not least, the vision of the four wild beasts introduces the person known as the Antichrist. It's been said that if the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, then the book of Daniel is a revelation of the Antichrist. And I believe that. In this particular vision, we're going to get our first real look at the Antichrist. Everyone wants to know about the Antichrist. How do we have so much information on him? We're here in this very first seal and the white horse comes out. And some people have misinterpreted thinking, well, Jesus is going to ride a white horse. Yes, but this is the Antichrist. 
This is the person who's going to imitate Jesus. That's why he is riding a white horse. Not only that, when he first comes on the scene, he brings peace. But how do we know so much about the Antichrist? Daniel. The vision that Daniel had. Now, let's see how the vision of the four, white, or the four wild beasts corresponds to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then we're going to see what it has to say about the Antichrist. Because that's the real reason that we're actually studying this vision. We want to see what it has to say about the Antichrist. Because when we get to the book of Revelation and we know certain things about the Antichrist, people who haven't come to this portion are going to say, well, how do you know that? Well, we studied that in the book of Daniel. So let's just go through chapter 7, verse by verse, and sometimes we're going to combine verses. Look at verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon... Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. In other words, visions in his head. And then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, the vision occurred in the first year of Belshazzar's reign. Now, we're not really certain when Belshazzar... See if I can get that right. Belshazzar started his reign. But most scholars believe that he only reigned with his father for three years. And we know that he was killed in 538 B.C., maybe 539. So this vision probably took place in the year 541 B.C., which means that Daniel was a very old man. He'd been retired for probably about 23 years. So that puts him around 85 years old when he has his vision. Now, the first thing that Daniel saw in the vision was the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Now, in the Old Testament, the great sea always referred to the Mediterranean Sea. And it is a great sea. In fact, when we go to Israel the first night, we will stay right, up on, right on the Mediterranean Sea. And if you want to go out and swim in it, you can. But it's this huge, and I would call it an ocean, but it is this huge sea. And in the Old Testament, they always referred to the Mediterranean Sea as the Great Sea. That was the Great Sea of the ancient world. If you remember, in that time, you didn't sail off into the Atlantic Ocean. Why? Well, you're going to fall off the edge of the world. The world is flat. Now, we know that the Bible teaches that the world is not flat. Did you know that? The, world, or the Bible is always taught that the earth is not flat. That's interesting, isn't it? But at that time, the Gentile nations thought that the world was flat. If you sail out in the Atlantic Ocean, you're going you're to sail off the, the edge, and you're just going to go into nowhere. And as a result of that, the only place they really sailed was in the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. But it also rep represented, the Great Sea did, the Gentile nations. Let me give you two examples of this. First, an Old Testament example. Look at Isaiah chapter 17, verses 12 through 13. It says, listen. The armies of many nations roar like the roaring of the sea. Hear the thunder of the mighty forces as they rush forward like thundering waves. But though they thunder like breakers on a beach, God will silence them and they will run away. They will flee like chaff scattered by the wind, like a tumbleweed whirling before a storm. Now here's what's interesting. What is he liking it to? The roaring of the sea and the sea that they're talking about is the Mediterranean Sea. So many times, the Great Sea represented the Gentile nations. Now, let me give you a New Testament example. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse number 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling, the sea, represents masses of people of every nation and language. Now, when it says masses of people of every nation and language, it's talking about the Gentile nations. Now, for us, that's a new revelation, but not to the Jew. Whenever you mention the Great Sea, it referred to the Mediterranean Sea, but it also represented the Gentile nations. Because there's only a few Gentile nations that would go through Israel, but many times they sailed from the Great Sea, and that was their coastline. And those armies would come up on the coastline like these big waves. And that's what they were talking about in Isaiah. So the Great Sea is the Mediterranean Sea, but it represents the Gentile nations. And in this vision... The four winds of heaven, God has something to do with this, is stirring up the Gentile nations just like the wind stirs up the great sea. And out of this stormy sea of nations, kingdoms are going to rise. Which takes us to verse 3. 
And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. In other words, different from one another. Out of this sea, the Gentile nations, four different beasts came up. Now, if you remember, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the statue represented four kingdoms or four empires. The Babylonian Empire, the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire. These four beasts coming up out of the sea are going to correspond with the four empires in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, these beasts did not come up all at one time. They came up one after another. We know that because Daniel numbers them in the order that they came up. In fact, when he gets to the fourth beast, he says, after this. Why does he say that? Because after this beast came the second beast, and after the second beast came the third beast, and after the third beast came the fourth beast. So they didn't come up all at once. They came up at different times. Look at verse 4. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand up on the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, if you paid attention during Desert Storm, you probably noticed the symbol of Iraq. What is the symbol of Iraq? Here you go. A lion with eagle's wings, right? That was the symbol or is the symbol of Iraq. But it's also the symbol or was the symbol of ancient Babylon. So here you have the Babylonian Empire rising up out of the Gentile nations. Now, what's kind of interesting, as soon as this first nation came up, Daniel knew exactly who it was. Ah! Oh. That's the symbol. I've walked in these courts. That's where I'm at right now. I know that this is the Babylonian Empire. So the first beast represents the first empire. Verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. The second beast was like a bear. Now, the bear is one of the strongest animals alive but it doesn't have the agility and the coordination of other wild animals. It's kind of awkward in its movement. How many of you have ever seen a bear walk? It kind of looks like it's lumbering, doesn't it? And I mean, many times it will try to sit up on a log and just roll over. It's just kind of slow and awkward and doesn't seem to have much coordination until it attacks you, right? It's awkward in its movements, but it's able to overcome its victims by brute force in sheer strength. Now people, that's a perfect description of the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire overthrew other nations by hurling vast masses of troops against them. In fact, Xerxes conquered Greece by actually amassing an army of 2,500,000 men. Do you remember the story or the movie of the 300? Remember, Xerxes came, Xerxes was there, and he had this mass army. I mean, they couldn't believe how many... That's actually built on fact. He brought 2,500,000 troops to Greece to conquer them. That's why it was able to devour much flesh. Now, if you notice, it says that the bear raised itself up on one side. Now, what that means is when it stood up, it didn't raise up both paws. It raised up on one side and kind of tilted. Does that make sense? So what it's actually saying is one side was more dominant than the other. It didn't just come in and hit its enemy with both hands. It raised up and it swooped down with one. And of course, that represents Persia because Persia was stronger than Media. It also had, this bear did, three ribs in its mouth. Now, what's kind of interesting is that the Babylonian Empire was divided into three different provinces. So the three ribs represent the three provinces of Babylon. So as you can see, the second beast in this vision corresponds to the second kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now what's kind of interesting is, the leopard is the most agile and graceful of all the wild animals. It's in that class. It's slight in frame, but it's strong and it's swift and it's fierce. It's a perfect description of the Grecian Empire. You see, the army of Alexander the Great was very small. When you compared it to the Medo-Persian army, it was kind of amazing. 
they took, in a sense, a, a, a really small army and they were able to defeat larger armies because they were well-equipped, well-trained, and very quick. With cunning and quickness, it overthrew the Persian Empire and subdued the whole civilized world. In fact, if you study military history, it was one of the first armies to actually divide its army up into different divisions. They had different responsibilities. They had different people over them. And so when they would come in, they would actually get to the battle scene before the others. They would get to a strategic location. They would scan it out, study it all, and then they would divide the army into different divisions. They would lure the enemy in, and they would conquer them that way. They were just like a leopard, a leopard that's stalking its prey and waits till it gets to the right place before it strikes. But I want you to notice that the third beast had four heads. Why? Well, what happened to Alexander the Great? After Alexander the Great died, the empire was divided among four generals. We talked about this when we were looking at the dream. Cassander was over one. He took Macedonia in the western parts. Lysimachus took Thrace in the northern part of the empire. Seleucus, who took Syria in the eastern part. And Ptolemy, who took Egypt in the southern part. That's why the third beast had four heads. Verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now the iron teeth correspond to the iron legs of the image of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The ten horns correspond to what? The ten toes. Yes. So the fourth beast represents who? The fourth empire. The Roman empire. Notice that it devoured and broke in broken pieces. And it stamped the residue with its feet. That is a perfect description of the Roman empire. The Roman empire people were vicious and powerful. And it trampled upon anyone who resisted it. In fact, if anyone overcame them, they made sure as a lesson to all other nations, that they would go back with more men and they would conquer whoever it was. When we go back to Israel, we'll take you to Masada. And Masada is a very interesting place. That was one of Herod's great temples. But you go up on this mountain, and really it was just this perfect place of protection. And it's really interesting. They built it in such a way that when it rained, and it rarely rained, but when it did, all of the water, because there's nothing around it, big splash floods, would flow into these great cisterns that were protected. And so they could actually have their slaves go in and they would dip this water in the system, carry it up to it, and they had all this water. It was just this wonderful place. Well, of course, in 70 AD, we all know the story, when the Romans came in and they actually conquered Jerusalem, you had some of those who went to Masada. Well, they weren't going to let anyone escape. Why? Because this is an example to the whole world that if you stand up to Rome, we will trample you down. Now it's very interesting because it says that it, it actually stamped them in. Now what's interesting about the Roman soldier's outfit, when we look at its weapons, literally on the bottom of the sandals were these two inch spikes like cleats. In fact, you would hear the Roman army actually coming down and the reason why, if you have, think about uh, baseball cleats. How many of you ever seen baseball cleats that have steel cleats on them? When people walk with those steel cleats in baseball and they hit that concrete, it's like click, 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 click. Well, when you have the Roman army coming and they have these two-inch spikes on the bottom of their sandals, they're coming in, you hear them. But here's what was so scary. When they're fighting you, they literally could come out and kick you in the thigh and literally just gash open your thighs. But not only that, if you're down on the ground, they can stamp on you and drive two-inch spikes into you and you're not getting up. So literally what Daniel saw is a perfect description of the Roman Empire. Nothing could stand in its way. Now, in the next verse, we're going to see something new. Something we didn't see in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and in the interpretation of it. All right? You see, so far, there's nothing new in this vision. It's just from a different perspective. We're seeing the very same thing that Nebuchadnezzar saw, except it's just in a different way. It's from God's perspective. You see, Daniel knew from Nebuchadnezzar's dream that there was going to be four great empires. That's nothing new. And he knew that after the fourth empire fell, it was going to be revived in the last days. 
and that the, then, and that the revived Roman Empire was going to have a ten-nation confederacy. So nothing in the vision so far was anything new. But in verse number 8 and on, we're going to get some new information. And we're going to go into a, a heck of a lot more detail. It's new revelation. Look at verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns, the ten horns that correspond to the ten toes, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boast. Now, some of you might be thinking, no, Alan, we saw that little horn. That was in the ram, the vision of the ram and the he-goat. Now, we kind of got things out of order because I didn't want you to get confused with Antiochus Epiphanes with the Antichrist. So we actually looked at that vision first, but that vision is actually a little bit later. And if you remember, it says, out of the four horns. Remember when the, the shaggy uh, goat came and it hit the ram? And it broke the two horns, which was Medo-Persian. But there was only one horn in this eventually. But then it says, out of the one horn came four horns. And then it tells us that this little horn came up. And who was the little horn? Antiochus Epiphanes. But I told you that Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist. This is not a type. We're getting ready to see the Antichrist here, all right? So, and behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man. And a mouth that was uttering great boast. This was something we didn't see in chapter 2. And in the midst of the ten horns, this little horn rises up. And this horn possesses eyes like a man and a mouth like a man. So this horn isn't just a nation. What is this horn? This horn is a man. That's why when you see artists and they, grow this, that they uh, draw this graphic uh, 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 of this beast... They'll show these horns, but on this little horn, you'll always see two eyes in a mouth. Why? Because this little horn doesn't represent a nation. It represents a man. Now, I've already let the cat out of the bag, but who is this? Can you guess? Of course, it's the Antichrist. Now, notice in verse 8 that three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots. In other words, they no longer exist. This man is going to conquer and gain complete control of three of the nations in this ten-nation confederacy. Almost a third of the alliance he's going to actually be over. And the rest are actually going to give him their authority and their power. In fact, if you don't mind, let's jump ahead and let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 13, and you're going to find out that John's vision is so similar to Daniel's. Notice what it says. The ten horns of the beast. Wow. Wow. This could have been Daniel's vision. Our ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms from one brief moment to reign with the beast. Now remember I told you there's going to be a gap of time. The Roman Empire is going to fall. But it's going to rise again. And there's going to be this ten nation confederacy. And John tells us in his vision these kings aren't reigning. They're all going to reign in their appointed time for one brief moment. And when are they going to reign? They're going to reign, we found out, when Christ is getting ready to come. Right before he comes back. They're going to reign during the tribulation. And it says, they will all agree to give him their power and their authority. So, John wasn't the first to see this vision. Daniel was. Now, notice in verse number 8 that the Antichrist will utter great boast. Now, people, that doesn't just mean that he's arrogant and he's going around boasting. When we see that, the first thing we think is, well, he's making these great boasts. That's not what this means. People, this is a Hebrewism. This is a figure of speech that Jews were very familiar with. When it says that he was boasting or uttering great boasts, it means that he was claiming to be God or he's claiming to be as great as God. So we get our first really true picture of the Antichrist in this vision. This man is going to rise up during, because first the ten kings come on the, on the scene. 
So he comes up after the ten kings. But when he comes into power, he plucks up three of the horns by the roots. He's completely in control of them. And then we find out, because we like to jump to the end of the book, and we find out that the others are actually going to give him their power and authority. But Daniel tells us that he is uttering these great boasts. And it's a Hebrewism. It means that he's claiming to be God. And we're going to find out a little bit further in the book of Daniel that he's going to demand to be worshipped. Now this is very interesting. Because Antiochus Epiphanes claimed to be God and wanted to be worshipped. And that's supposedly the abomination of desolation. But when Jesus is teaching, which is after that period of time, he acts like the abomination of desolation hasn't even taken place. Why does he do that? The reason he does that is because he sees this for when it's really going to happen, which is in the tribulation. He understands that Antiochus Epiphanes is just a type. Now, if this vision truly corresponds with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, how would we expect this vision to end? What happened in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? It wasn't just the four kingdoms. What happened? This stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. And this rock smashed the feet. And all of the statue crumbled in the wind that blew it away. And then that rock did what? It grew into a mountain, mountain and... It covered the entire earth, right? Now, we know that stone is Jesus. He is the rock of our salvation. And we know that when that stone grew into mountain, it's his kingdom. This kingdom is actually going to destroy this ten-nation confederacy. That's what it meant when it smashed the feet. It smashed, it destroyed this ten-nation confederacy. And then when it says that it grew into mountain and it spread over the entire earth, what it means is his kingdom was over the entire earth. And then it said it was going to last forever. So, if the vision in chapter 7 corresponds to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, dream in chapter 2, what should we see in the next few verses? Well, we should see the return of Jesus Christ, right? Would you expect to see that? And we should see him striking the ten-nation confederacy, the feet of clay and iron, and we should see him establishing his kingdom here upon the earth. Well, guess what? That's exactly what we're going to see in verses 9 through 14. And we're also going to get a lot more information about this than we did in chapter 2. In chapter 2, it was just kind of symbolisms. Not here. He actually sees in the vision almost exactly what John saw in his revelation. There are six verses that's dedicated to just this one little part. So let's look at verses 9 through 14. We'll go through them quickly. Verse 9. I kept looking until the thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. Remind you of anyone? His throne was ablaze with flames and his wheels were burning fire. Now we're going to see the judgment that's going to fall on the Gentile nations. And it's not going to be pretty. See, from the time of the Babylonian captivity all the way into the end of the tribulation, this is known as the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles is not the same as the fullness of the Gentiles. When we think of the fullness of the Gentiles, what are we talking about? We're talking about the church age. Because the Jews rejected Jesus, the Gentiles were grafted in. That's the church age. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is reached, in other words, everyone that's going to come in that's going to be saved is here. And everything's just right, we're going to be raptured out. At that point, the church age is over. We're raptured, the tribulation begins. But the, but the times of the Gentiles is still going on. Now here's the whole thing that the Jews have always been wondering. If we're God's chosen people, why are the Gentiles ruling over us? Even now, I want you to understand something. Even though Israel is in control of its own nation, it does what we tell it to. What America tells it to. Did you know that? So in a sense, the Gentile... Nations are still ruling Israel. And they want to know, when's it going to stop? When is it going to stop? When Jesus comes back. Does that make sense? Now, all of a sudden, at this point, the thrones are set up. What did we study in chapter 5? When we finished chapters 2 and 3, we went to 4 and 5. We saw the rapture, but we also saw a vision of heaven. And there wasn't just one throne 
there were thrones around the throne of God. Do you remember that? John was not the first to see that. Daniel was. And so now judgment's going to fall upon the Gentile nation. It's not going to be pretty. Verse 10. The river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Now normally when we think of God sitting on his throne, what do we think of? We think of a river of living water flowing from his throne blessing the nations. Is that not what you think of? Yes, but that's not the picture. Here it's a river of fire. That's because it's judgment time, baby. When the tribulation happens, all of those who are in Christ Jesus, they're out of here. This is judgment time on the Gentile nations. Now, again, we're gone, but those who are left behind, the Gentiles, they're going to have to face the judgment of God. And now all of a sudden, God's going to be upon Israel's side, and he's going to use this tribulation to bring them back to faith in Christ Jesus, to draw them back to him. But I want you to notice something else. Notice that thousands of thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. Does that remind you of anything that we studied? Remember the angels? What did John say? He said, I saw in Revelations 5.11. Look there. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Could Daniel have written that? Not only could he have written it, he did. This is what Daniel saw. Daniel saw the very same thing as John. That's why as we go through the book of Revelation, we'll keep going back to Daniel. And then it says the books were opened. Books refer to an accounting system. So what this is telling us, it's judgment day. God's not forgotten anything. Now the books are opened. You're going to have to give an account of what's taking place. And who is the first to get judged? Verse 11. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words, which the horn spoke, not the ten, the little horn. And because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now this beast not only refers to the ten nation confederates of the revived Roman Empire, but also to the Antichrist. That's why we refer to the Antichrist many times as the beast. You'll find that in Revelation. What's another name for the Antichrist? The beast. So, the beast, which is this ten-nation confederacy, but we're going to find out God has something special planned for this Antichrist. It's slain. And the leader of the Antichrist, or the leader of the ten-nation confederacy, the Antichrist, is thrown into the lake of fire. Now, people, this is exactly what John saw in Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. Notice what it says. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against the rider and the horse and his army. Now, What's he referring to the Antichrist as here? The beast. Now he's not referring to the beast here in, in, in Revelation as the ten nation confederacy. Why? Because he says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. These kings are the ten kings. They were gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Who's the rider on the horse? Jesus. It's not this one who is the counterfeit. It's the true one that's coming back with us. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Those who received the mark of the Antichrist, and they worshipped the Antichrist. Does that make sense? The two of them, the beast and the false prophet. This is kind of interesting. We talk about the Trinity, I'm going to get ahead of myself. We talk about the Trinity, which is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Do you realize there's a satanic Trinity? Mm -hmm. there's the devil, the antichrist, and who? The false prophet. And what we see is for everything that God does, Satan has a counterfeit. They are, these two of them were thrown, now notice this, alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Now look back in verse 12 in, in Daniel chapter 7. Now we're back in Daniel. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now this is hard to understand unless you understand that this should have been in parentheses. 
If it was in parentheses, it would help you to understand because this is not in chronological order in this vision. He's just giving you, well, what happened to the other three beasts? How many of you are thinking, well, what happened to the other three beasts that came up? Well, he tells us. You see, he's just telling you what happened to them in history. Their dominion was taken away. The Medo-Persian Empire took the Babylonian dominion away. The Grecian Empire took the Medo-Persian's dominion away. And the Roman Empire took the Greeks' dominion away. But they all had their season in the sun, and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. In other words, God's judgment did not come upon them like it did or it will on this ten-nation confederacy that rises up against God. See, this ten-nation confederacy that rises up, it's going to wage war against God. And let me tell you, it won't win. Jesus wins. 